Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's event is organized by the USC Price School of Public Policy and the Behavioral Science Society, which is the student organization of the Behavioral Science and Wellbeing Policy Initiative. We'd like to thank our funding from uh, the USC Research Collabor Collaboration Fund, um, which has allowed us to send out free books to um, the first dozen of students who uh, signed up for this event. Um, I'd like to now introduce our moderator, Patricia Sloboda, who is on the executive board of the Behavioral Science Society and a visiting scholar in USC's Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Her expertise is in behavioral science and the psychology of decision making. Welcome, Patricia. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are so privileged to have Wendy Wood with us today. Wendy is a professor of psychology and business at the University of Southern California and the author of the book, Good Habits, Bad Habits, The Science of Making Positive Changes That Stick. For the past 30 years, Wendy's research has examined the nature of habits and why they are so difficult to break. Her research has been featured in the New York Times, uh, NPR, the Wall Street Journal, and the New Yorker magazine. We look forward to your talk, Wendy, and to uh, learn more about your book. And in about 30 minutes, we'll move to Q&A. If anyone would like to ask a question, please, you can do so with the Q&A function. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, and thank you, Wendy and the Price School for organizing this. As Patricia said, I have been studying habits for the past 30 years, but I didn't start out that way. I started out studying how to change people's attitudes and beliefs. And that's hard. We don't always know how to do that, but we have some models. And those models help us figure out how to change attitudes and beliefs. <laughs> the challenge when I started this research was behaviors seem to be different. So a lot of us know what we should do to be healthy, right? We should eat better, we should exercise more, but so many of us don't do it. And those are the kinds of questions that started me thinking about the issue of habits and the issue of behavior change in general. So I'm gonna be talking about my book today, which will give some highlights of understanding habits, but for the research behind the book, I'm happy to share papers with anyone who's interested. So we're all trying to reach goals and trying to figure out how to do things like change our behavior so that we can meet new goals. And how we do this really depends upon the kind of behavior that we, that, that we need to perform. So some goals can be met with a single action. If you're trying to register to vote, really all you need to do is go online, figure out how registration works in your state, and then make yourself do it. It's a single action. And it's something that we can get ourselves to do if we just try hard enough. Other goals though, it turned out in my research are a little different. Goals where you have to act repeatedly, like being fit or living within your budget, or if you're a student, getting good grades, those goals aren't things that we can achieve just by making a decision and doing it. Now you might think you can, and that's the challenge with understanding how to use habits effectively, but they're different from our decisions. And that's because of the way our brains have evolved. Human brains have a lot of different systems. We think of it as kind of a unified whole, as a thing that helps us navigate through the world, but it's actually composed of a bunch of different systems, 
each of which evolved at a slightly different point in time. And as we evolved new systems, old systems fell away, they modified slightly, so that we have a very effective system for thinking, making decisions, implementing those one-off decisions like registering to vote. And then we have a slightly different system that is suited for repeating actions. And the interesting thing is that this repeating system, this habit system is shared by all mammals. So what I'm gonna tell you is very similar to the way you might go about trying to train your dog, right? Because they have a similar sort of a habit system to what we do. We have a very much better, but very much more developed goal-directed thinking deciding system, but, but that habit network functions kind of the same across all mammals. One of the things about this habit network is that it's not conscious, right? If your dog uses it, it doesn't require higher order thought. Instead, it's a system that helps you do things, do the same thing over and over. So you can think of our brains as enabling us to know some things about ourselves, right? We know what we think, we know what we feel, we make these decisions, we exert effort. But then there's also this non-conscious habit system that involves repeating past actions. And it doesn't work in ways that might be intuitive to us. The end result is that we only sometimes act on our decisions. So if you're exercising, only sometimes, maybe in different contexts, different ways each time, then you're actually making decisions to get yourself out to go to the gym. You have to form that intention and act on it. But if you exercise repeatedly in the same context, in the same way, then your decision isn't as important. Instead, you're activating that habit system. And it's the habit system that will determine whether you go to the gym or not, whether it's your habit. So I was trying to think of ways to help you experience your habit. Because they work outside of conscious awareness. They sound kind of mystical, um, not, not very real. So let me give you a couple of examples that might make them seem more real. One thing is that habits are a doing system. So we don't always know what the things are that we're trying to do. Take typing. So we can all, most of us can type pretty well using keyboards. We use that second row of the keyboard without thinking much about it. But if I asked you to list the keys, list the letters on the second row of your keyboard, my guess is you probably couldn't do it very well. I can't, and I can type. That's habit, right? That's the, an indication of you have a set of knowledge, of understanding of what's on the keyboard. And then you have the habit system that uses the keyboard. I mean, you've probably experienced this already in studying, right? When you study, your brain starts to wander, you get tired, you realize you're reading stuff. So the habit of reading is still working, but you're not comprehending it. So your habit in that case is not meeting your goal of understanding what you're doing. And let me give you one more example to try to help you feel what habits are. And this is a children's game. <laughs> it just involves naming farm animals. So look at a figure and name as fast as you can the farm animal that is depicted. That's what a habit feels like. If you felt a small amount of hesitation, 
because you're looking on the far left at an image that's clearly a pig, right? Snout, curly tail, but it says dog. So this is pitting your habit of reading against your interpretation of the picture. It can slightly get in your way until you make a decision, of course that's wrong, that's not a dog, it's a pig. So you had to override your habit in order to recognize the animals correctly. So how do habits form? Well, they form from repetition. And if you're taking the expo line to campus at USC, when the world opens up again, as we hope it does soon, at first you're, you're making decisions. You have to figure out, well, what time should I leave home? You have to find the transit stop. Is it still working? What route do you take? All of these things are very thoughtful. It makes the first few days a little stressful and overwhelming. But over time, things simplify. So as you repeat a behavior over and over, habit memories form. You start creating those memories in the habit neural system. So you get up in the morning, you take a shower, check the time, have some coffee, and then you get on the train just the way that you did yesterday and the day before, and you get to school at the same time. What habits do, what that habit learning system does is it connects rewarding responses, responses that are rewarded in some way, meaning in this case, they get you to work at school with the context in which you perform that response. So our mornings run off, context response, context response, doing very much the same things as we've done before, every once in a while stopping to do something different, but most of the pattern is the same. And we've shown in our research that once habits form, all you have to do is perceive the context. All you have to do is perceive your bathroom early in the morning and you start taking a shower and brushing your teeth. It works this way for other habits as well. We've done research with runners where we presented them, primed them with the context, the location in which they typically ran. And for runners with strong habits, that response of running, the habitual response, very quickly came to mind. So when in that context, that's what people think of. And this, in a way, is kind of the meaning of automaticity, right? When you hear that term automaticity, habits are automatic. What you're saying is you are retrieving from memory a solution to a problem in the past. In this case, an action that was successful in the past. So that's what automaticity means. And that's why we say habits are automatic. You don't have to struggle to remember them. You don't even have to be aware that they're coming to mind. You just act on the response that's very available at that point. So how much of our behavior runs off like this? I argued that it's part of our morning routine, but most of us think of habits as, hmm, Small behaviors like brushing our teeth or whether we wear a seatbelt when we get in a car, all of us, of course, do. Um, but when we first started working in this area, one of the questions we asked is how much of our behavior is controlled in this way? So we used a methodology and a, a research design in which we tr tracked people for two days and we contacted them each hour and asked them, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? 43% of the time, people said they were doing something that they do almost every day in that location. 
And most of the time they weren't even thinking about what they were doing. So they're acting in a way that doesn't require thought and decision. They're simply repeating what they've done in the past. So they're acting in a habitual way. And you might think, yeah, sure, but doesn't apply to all behaviors. It was amazing, but it really did. It's not just getting ready in the morning. It's also eating. We're often thinking about something else while we're eating the same things as we ate yesterday at the same time. Happens when we're cooking, even happens when we are watching TV or listening to music. Our mind starts wandering. We start doing what we've done before. Fortunately, when we're studying, it happens too. And when we're in transit, all of these are instances in which our behavior can become habitual. We can act in a habitual way. So habits form through repetition. And that's because that memory trace needs to be strengthened through experience. So you can't do it once and form a strong habit. Instead, you have to do it over and over again. So you're sort of writing over that memory trace until it becomes strong enough to be automatic. So the key to forming a new habit is to repeat behaviors. What gets people to repeat behaviors? Well, there was a great study done with New Year's resolutions that I think provides some good insight here. Now in January, many of us make resolutions and you know what they're gonna be, right? Diet and exercise are always everybody's favorite. Spend money, save money, spend less. That's the next um, most frequent resolution that people make. And in this study, no exception. That's what people were doing. But two months after they made resolutions, they were asked to rate them. They were asked to rate how useful, life-changing, and important the resolution was. And then would it be a positive experience? Would it be fun and engaging? Now, being life-changing and important is why we make resolutions, right? I mean, we wanna change our lives. We wanna do something different. But the interesting part about this study is that whether the resolution was fun, whether it was enjoyable and positive, that's what determined whether people stuck with it. So this is not at all the way we think about our behavior. We think we do the thing that was most important because that's why we made the resolution. But instead, it's the positive experience, the enjoyment, that makes us repeat the behavior and actually <laughs> succeed in meeting our New Year's resolutions. So this is part of the general phenomenon that people act on rewards. We are very influenced by our feelings of enjoyment. When we experience something that's fun, our brains respond by releasing the neurochemical dopamine. And you may have heard of dopamine, I'm sure you have. It's thought to be the feel-good chemical. Well, it does lots of things. One of the things it does is it ties together what's currently in memory. It builds habits in habit memory. So it's connecting the context that you're in and the response you just gave that got you that reward. So that next time you're in that context, the response comes to mind and you don't have to make a decision. Instead, you're doing what worked in the past. So dopamine is really important for forming new habits. You need to get some good feeling from performing the behavior. One of the tricks about dopamine though is it works for a very short amount of time, only a few seconds, to have this integrative habit building effect, which means that 
You can't reward yourself with something at the end of the week, something at the end of the month. Instead, it has to be right now when you perform the behavior for that dopamine to be released and habits to form. So what gets us to repeat behaviors? One answer to this is rewards. And if you repeat a behavior more often, you're more likely to form a habit. That habit memory trace strengthens. Also, if you get a reward, there's the release of dopamine and then stronger habits form. So rewards are great in two ways. They get us to repeat. They also release dopamine. And both of those help to form stronger habits. But there's another trick to forming strong habits that is very clear in the research literature. And that is make repetition easy. So you're going to repeat behaviors if it's easy for you to do so. What does it mean easy? Reduce friction. Reduce the forces in the environment that make it more difficult. So you want to reduce effort. You want to reduce the amount of time it takes. You want to reduce the amount of thought you have to give something. That's all reducing what we call friction. Now, friction is a term, obviously, from the physical environment, right? Friction is a force that stops motion. Psychologists believe that friction also works with our behavior, that effort, time, and thought reduce the likelihood that we're going to repeat a behavior and then form a habit. So some context just plausibly make it easier to repeat desired behavior. I think we've all had the experience of pandemic friction on our workplace, schoolwork, on many activities that we're trying to do. And that's pretty obvious, but other kinds of friction aren't so obvious. So if you're trying to eat a healthier diet and snack less, most of us would start by resolving. We're going to clean up our diet. We're going to give up those donuts and we're going to try to exert willpower to do so but there are easier ways to do it. And one form of friction is just distance. So if you're trying to control snacking, put the food further away from you. It won't stop you eating it. So if you're desperate, you're gonna grab for some. But if it's further away, you are less likely to eat it. And if you do eat it, you're gonna eat less of it. There's great research data on this. Use friction to your advantage. If you're trying to control your spending, friction comes in the form of time and thought. There's great research showing that if we use cash to pay for things, we spend less. And that's because it's just more difficult. Right? It's really easy to pull out a debit or a credit card. It's harder to carry, make sure you have the cash available, carry it around with you, count it out. And then you also experience this loss after you spend the money in a way that you don't with a credit or debit card. And for spending, you also sort of have to take control back from retailers. So retailers have figured out how to make it easy to reduce the friction on our spending. That's why there's the one-click shopping. That's really successful. Two clicks and retailers lose us as customers. So they like one-click shopping. If you go into a store, another version of this, if you go into a store, there's, there's a saying that retailers have, that what's at eye level is buy level, 
meaning we're more likely to buy things that are at eye level than we are to search down the shelves by our feet or way up high. So they put things that they really want to sell at eye level. And the cheaper things that might be less profitable to them are in other places. Just be aware of this when you shop, because you can take back control by being aware of friction and not succumbing to it. I think one of the most interesting examples of friction has to do with distance. And this was a study that was done with our cell phones. So if you want to go to the gym, what determines whether you go? Most of us think, well, whether I have enough willpower today, if I want to go, if I'm really feeling the need to work out, those are reasons that many of us think we go to the gym. But this cell phone study revealed friction may be involved too. What they did is they tracked how far our cell phones and people holding them um, traveled to paid gymnasiums over two months in 2017. And there were millions of cell phones in this study. What they found is that people who travel, this is the paid fitness center and the two cell phone people, um, people who traveled 3.6 miles to the gym went five times a month on average. People who went had to travel 5.1 miles to the gym, they only went once a month. So that's a really small difference, right? 3.6 versus 5.1, that doesn't seem plausible that that would have a major effect, but it's the difference between having an exercise habit and not. Distance makes a real difference for the habits we form. Just because if you can make it easier, reduce friction, you're simply more likely to do it. And then my final example of friction is another example that we probably aren't very aware of in general, but it has to do again with exercising. And if you were going to try to convince yourself to start taking the stairs, as we all should, um, particularly in something like a four-story office building and quit using the elevator, you might start in the same way that these researchers did, which is putting, you start convincing yourself. It's a good thing to do. And what these researchers did is they put up signs all over the elevator. Don't take the elevator, walking up the stairs, it's good for you, it's good for the environment. They did this for several weeks. Should have worked, but in actuality, it had no effect. So you think, well, maybe people are just really lazy or maybe they're just not reading the signs or who knows what's going on here. Well, the researchers were very smart. And what they did is they, then decided we're going to change this environment and add some friction. So they delayed the elevator door closing by 16 seconds, right? That's almost nothing. They just made it slower. So you had to wait for the elevator door to close. And that cut elevator trips by a third. And the really cool thing about this study is after a whole month, of having this slow elevator closing, the researchers put the elevator back to its normal speed, but people have formed a habit of taking the stairs. They actually had started doing so often enough so that it was habitual and they didn't start taking the elevator again. So in summary, I would say that if you want to form new habits, you want to repeat a behavior often, and you want to enlist rewards to make it enjoyable. Another thing you can do is alter the environment so that you're altering friction on the behavior so that the new behavior is easier and others that you don't want to do are more difficult. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Wendy. That was great. Um, uh, we have already some questions from our audience. And the first one is, what's the role of Skinnerian punishment in forming habits as opposed to rewards, if any? Well, a challenge with punishments is that it teaches you what not to do, not necessarily what to do. So punishments can certainly stop people doing a behavior, but it's not as successful as rewards simply because you're not then developing a habit memory that indicates what you should be doing in the future. Right. Um, and another question is about reducing friction in, um, uh, in, uh, in terms of studying. So how have you seen reducing friction work effectively in terms of studying? Yeah, this is always a challenge. Um, I would say that we all probably know what would reduce friction. Yeah. So studying in quiet places where people aren't going to bother you, that's a good way to reduce friction. In the library in particular <laughs> is a really good way because then there's people around you who are studying too and they, they can sort of cue you to keep focusing on the behavior that you're trying to repeat. Um, leaving your cell phone at home and disabling the internet while you're not working on stuff with it is a really good way to reduce friction as well, because social media is so distracting at this point for most of us that it's hard to get on a computer, it's hard to have a phone with you and then ignore the social media contacts. So I try to leave my phone outside of the room that I'm working. And I try not to check online for anything except work activities. And that's a pretty effective way to control friction. That sounds like a great advice. Uh, you also mentioned rewards and you write about it in your book that rewards are very important in building new habits. However, many of our behavior we want to change are hardly fun and very difficult to find rewarding. So what do we, what do, we do? How do we um, start recognizing rewards in behaviors that we don't really like and for which it takes longer time to, to see desirable change, such as weight loss or benefits of healthy diet? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, particularly for things like diet and exercise, we have more options probably than we realize. So I would say try a lot of things to start until you find something that you really enjoy that is rewarding. And sometimes that will involve adding things to an activity. So when I work out, I read trashy novels and I watch stupid TV shows that I wouldn't have time for normally, but it makes it fun. And I've actually started kind of looking forward to the what, what could be a really boring workout. It makes it interesting listening to podcasts, listening to books on tape. Those are things that energize you when you're doing it and can seem very rewarding. But food is the same way. Um, how our mothers cooked vegetables is probably not how we want to eat them now. So finding ways to cook food that makes it enjoyable. That's, there are many options out there and I just suggest that you keep trying ones until you figure out what's going to work for, for you to make it fun. We should remember that. Most of the time, we think about habits from a very personal and individual perspective. But in the context of climate change and sustainability, apart from, of course, individual role and behavior change, what may be the role of policymakers in creating habits among citizens? 
Yeah, I think that's a really, it's an important question because what we repeat is not just a function of what we want to do or what we think we should do or what we value. It's really a function of what's fun in a given context and what is easy. And policymakers, their role should be understanding that people can have the best of intentions. We can all intend to do the right things, but if it's difficult, if it's not fun, um, people are gonna have a hard time sticking with it. The average person is not gonna find it something that is gonna become a habit. And energy use, um, environmental issues are a clear example of this. So one thing we can do is make it easier for people to make the right decision. And this is similar to what um, nudge theorists have argued, that if you shape environments so that people make the right decisions easily and have to think to make the wrong ones, then that is a useful way of helping people control their behavior. So for the environment, we can make it harder to recycle and people don't recycle out of outside of cities on a very um, regular basis, simply because it's just too hard. You have to drag your stuff to the recycling center. In cities where there's recycling pickup, people are much more likely to do that. And it's not because people in cities are better, more concerned about the environment. Instead, it's that it's just easier. So providing that structure that makes it easier is something that's really important um, for environmental preservation as we're all trying to think about how to address climate change. Yeah, that's a, that's a challenge and um, definitely uh, nudging and behavior science can help us um, in some way to, uh, to change our behavior. And we're currently, all most of us uh, at home and the, um, we probably also have created new habits during pandemics. So the question is, how has the pandemic changed our habits? And if we developed any good habits during the pandemic, how do we keep those? And how do we get rid of the bad ones? Do you have any advice for us? Yeah. So yes, the pandemic, I think one of the reasons why the pandemic was such a challenge to begin with is because it disrupted our habits. And so we had to start thinking. <laughs> there was the fear. We didn't really know how we were going to um, contract this thing, what would make it put us at risk. So we had to keep making decisions. Should we go to the grocery store? How often? Um, how likely are we to get sick if we go? So there was all of that fear and concern, but also, you know, it wasn't easy to figure out how am I going to keep working? So if you still had a job and you were asked to work from home, which is a good thing, but that was a challenge in and of itself because many of us had kids, they needed to be schooled remotely. We had to figure out places to work at home. Our houses are not set up for that. Lots of decision-making initially. And as the pandemic has worn on, we changed our habits. We formed new ones because it's lasted so long. It's been know, over a year now that we have being under various lockdown conditions. Um, and so we now, once things are going to start opening up and we certainly hope they do soon, um, we're gonna have sort of two sets of habits that we can follow. And I think for many of us, the habits that we choose are going to depend upon our work setting. So if we continue to work from home, I think we'll, be using that context, that context is going to keep activating the behaviors that we practiced during the pandemic. So if you started a garden, if you started cooking more at home, those are things that you're likely to continue to do. But if you go back to work at the office, 
if you have been working in, in, an, uh, in a um, retail setting the whole time or some other setting, then you're going to have that set of habits that will be reactivated. It really depends very much on the context in which we live, what habits are going to be activated, and we're going to be able to make choices. Right? For the first few weeks when we go back, we're going to be in a decision-making mode again. So expect to be a little tired and feel a little overwhelmed because that's what habits do once they're in place. They simplify our lives for us and they make decision-making much more efficient. We just do what we did in the past and we think about other things than our day-to-day -day behavior, which is usually good. Yeah, and it, it sounds like it's a great time for policymakers once the pandemic ends to help us create good habits. Well, there have been some great examples of that. Um, not so much in the US, a little bit in New York City, um, but certainly in Paris where um, the mayor has changed the um, transit policies in Paris to create many more bike lanes and to shut down some streets from cars. And because people were at home, they weren't feeling like, my city is changing on me. I don't have choices. In fact, when, when things open up, they may feel like they have more choices, right? They can go back and they can get on a bike and go places. They have this idea of a 15 minute city where you can reach all of your stores and dry cleaning and schools and within 15 minute walk or bike ride. So taking advantage of pandemic shutdowns to institute policies that give people more choice is a really good um, strategy for policymakers because then people don't experience the same disruption. Now their lives are already being disrupted. Um, so they don't experience that they're, they're losing options. Instead, it's possible to present it as gaining options. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And uh, we're all looking forward to go outside and get back to normal life. There is one question about future of uh, 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 habit research. What are some open questions on, uh, uh, in habit research? We are continuing to try to understand when people are acting on habit and when they're acting in a more thoughtful, goal-directed way. And a lot of behaviors are sort of complex. So they're kind of hybrids. They involve both habit and thought. And, and if you have a studying habit, you already know this because the habit is to study in a certain place, a certain time. This is what all really successful prolific writers do is they write for a certain amount of time every day. They write in a certain place. They write a certain number of words every day. So they have that repetition and that's the habit piece. The writing itself, of course, can't be habitual. That's creative, that's thought. You have to um, make things up, you have to integrate, you have to be systematic. None of those things are, are a habit thing. So really successful writers, people who study regularly, they have already integrated this habit plus more complex thought. And it means that you get to the place that you usually work and you set yourself up to do your best. And sometimes you, know, you get writer's block. You don't have anything to say. You're too, the, the material's too hard. You can't get it. But at least you're there and you're more likely to be productive and successful than if you didn't show up. So your habits help you get there. They don't do the work itself. 
of a creative task, but they get you there. And so that's the sort of integration that we are studying um, in understanding when habits will maintain and when people will be more thoughtful and deliberative and act on their decisions. So one thing that, um, that people sometimes misunderstand is stress. So stress is something that makes it harder for people to think and deliberate because when you're stressed, you can't really think about anything except the thing that's really stressful. So your thoughtful decision-making self is over there sort of obsessed with whatever the, the thing is that's stressing you out. And then your habit self is off repeating what behaviors you've done in the past. And we think that when we're stressed, we fall back on our bad habits. But habits don't know good and bad, right? Your habits are good or bad depending upon how well they correspond to your current goals. Good habits, consistent with your goals. Bad habits, inconsistent. We change our goals all the time, which is how we actually end up with many bad habits. Things that look like they were a good idea, you do them often enough, they're not so great anymore. And then we grow and mature and things change and we want to do something different. So that's how we get bad habits. But when we're stressed, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're tired, we fall back on good habits as well as bad ones because our decision-making self is out there focused on the stress and our habit self is just repeating whatever we've done in the past. So that's another reason why it's really important to form good habits because you're more likely to fall back on them then when you really need them, when you're feeling stressed, you're not going to deviate from them. You're going to stick with them. And um, it will be, yeah, um, the stressful experience won't be exacerbated by acting on bad habits as well as experiencing the stress. As we were talking about bad habits, uh, in your book, you also write about um, habits and addictions. Could you tell us a little bit more what's the difference between habits and addictions and how does the context matter here? Yeah, so there is no bright line between habits and addiction. I typically say that habits are a component of addiction. So addiction involves some habitual behavior. In fact, addictive substances have been shown to sort of hijack the habit system and make people even more <laughs> prone to form and rely on habits. Once you get ad addicted to something, it changes slightly the way your brain functions and you're more likely to act on habit, to make decisions out of habit because that part of your brain is sort of, it's, it's revved up by the addictive substance. But habits are both good and bad. They're just simply automaticity. It's the activation of responses that have worked in the past. Addictions have negative consequences for people and their families. And because people become obsessed with the addictive substance, and that's part of what addictive <laughs> these addictive things do to us is they become an obsession. So, so habits are a component of addiction, but they're not all of it. They're just a piece of it. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions from the audience. Uh, one of it, uh, which is, it's common to achieve weight loss goals only to regain the weight within a short period of time. Does this mean that the behavior change uh, that resulted in weight loss were not true habits? I would say yes, <laughs> because most of us approach weight loss as if it was a one-off thing, right? <laughs> it's like, as I said, registering to vote. We figure out how to do it. 
We steal ourselves, we white knuckle through it, we think about it all the time. Everything is reminding us of what we're missing, the food that we want to have. We weigh ourselves a lot. Um, we talk about it to other people. Weight loss is something that most people don't understand. You're likely to lose weight if you practice behaviors that will help you eat healthier and avoid ones that are going to get you to eat unhealthy things. Sounds too obvious, but it's really the way, so studies of people who have very um, healthy weights, that's what they do, is they just have formed habits to eat in healthy ways and they don't think about it. So it's not like they are exerting self-control and actively controlling their eating. Instead, they've practiced eating healthfully so much that it's become automatic and they don't have to make a decision anymore. They just eat the way they normally do. And if they overeat sometimes, we all do, um, then they just go back to their old habits. Now, the, the reason why most of us don't think about it this way is because it's not very gratifying, right? We're talking about slow, slow long-term weight loss that happens only gradually over time as you start establishing new habits. And habits can take several months to create. And we don't want that. We want immediate change. We want to make a decision and then have it happen. But you don't form new habits by making a decision. Habits form through experience. And it's that experience that you need to create in order to have healthy eating habits. Like there's a, there's a sort of a related insight that I think is one of the most interesting recent findings in the habit research area. And that is what we know about self-control is not very accurate. We've thought for a while that some people have a lot of self-control and they're able to um, make decisions and deny themselves and work to achieve goals. And those are the people we think with high self-control. But what research has done is it's actually observed what these high self-control people do every day. And what they do is they act on habit. They're really good at forming beneficial habits that allow them to achieve their goals without struggle. So they're not into self-denial. That's not how they do it. Instead, they have set their workstation up and they just show up at nine o'clock in the morning without wondering, hmm, would I rather watch TV? Would I rather listen to a podcast? Maybe I can surf the web. That's not it. They're just there automatically, it's that automaticity. And it starts them working in the morning and it keeps them until they're done in the afternoon. And it's the same thing with eating and exercise. People who have high self-control are successful because they have good habits. Good in the sense that it's helping them meet their goals. Thank you. I have one last question because we're going to be running out of time. But uh, the question is, what is your own personal favorite or mo most used strategy for building good habits in your own life? Oh, see, I think I gave it already is finding ways to make behavior that doesn't seem a whole lot of fun, more fun. So, <laughs> and um, so I used to be a runner and I loved to run outside, particularly early in the morning. It was something I found really fun, but I've gotten older. It doesn't work so well anymore. In fact, it hurts. Um, so I started working out on an elliptical and it is the most boring thing ever. Um, and I hated it 
for the first month. And I actually bought one. So I was committed, but I hated it and I wouldn't use it until I figured out this trick about trashy novels and podcasts and other things that I don't normally listen to. And it's made even an elliptical, something I look forward to working out on. Um, so, so I think it's possible to use that technique to encourage ourselves to do the right thing. Make it fun. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Wendy, this was great. And uh, we are all ready to work on our good habits, make them fun and reward ourselves. And um, thank you everyone for joining. Have a great Friday. Thanks again, bye.